All right, what's going on guys? Welcome back to another video. Before we get started, I just wanna preface this by saying this video is gonna be a little different than my usual ones. The case that I'm gonna be talking about today is just one that still is leaving me physically uncomfortable. I'm upset, I'm, I'm sad, I'm angry. I'm just feeling a, a lot of different emotions from this case. So I just wanna say like, Heads up, it's serious. There's a lot of things I wanna talk about and I think there's a few important notes that I wanna hit on. I guess I just kinda of felt like I couldn't kinda of format this into a normal video like I usually do with the uh, proper editing and the uh, little added bits in there. I just felt like I should speak, you know, to you guys directly. So I guess consider this sort of a podcast type of thing where you can just put it on in the background and relax. I'll be here meanwhile so you guys can just Get ready, start your day, or night, or whatever it is your little heart desires. Anyways, without further ado, let's get started. Today we're going to be talking about the of Junko Furuta. This was a girl that literally spent 44 days in hell. She was a 16-year-old Japanese high school student who was abducted and held captive and just subjected to unspeakable torment by her captors, until finally dying at the hands of her captors on November 22nd, 1989. This is an extremely famous case in Japan that sparked a lot of controversy, a lot of media attention. It's been dubbed the concrete encased high school girl case, and it's probably one of the most terrible things I have ever read about. So let's talk a little bit about Junko first, right? She's 16 year old high school Japanese student. She was from Misato. She was a very kind of like goody two shoes type of girl, really nice, respectful, active in school activities. And it's said that she enjoyed a lot of attention from other people, which may have made others jealous. She didn't smoke or drink or do any type of drugs. She just wanted to do her thing. She just wanted to study hard, get good grades, get a job and just live her life. And then we have Hiroshi Miyano. This guy had a crush on her for a while, but she never batted an eye at him back. Now this guy, he was like a big bully in school and he even like claimed to be like riding with the Yakuza, which you don't know are like the Japanese like mafia. So a lot of people like didn't dare to stand up to him and oppose him. And it was like a real thing that people were not scared of this guy just in school, like the students, like the, there were actual adults, parents, teachers that were scared of this guy as well. But despite all of that, our girl Junko still had the guts to say no and reject his ass. Basically, he asked her out, he professed his undying love. It probably wasn't romantic at all, let, let's be honest. And she basically rejected him. Now, the sad thing is that he did not take kindly to this at all. On November 25th, 1988, Junko was riding her bike home from school, or actually, I think it was home from her after school job where she worked at a plastics molding company. She was actually saving up to go on a... <sighs> she was saving up to go. Ah, oh, this case makes me so upset. She was saving up money to go on a graduation trip and treat herself after she graduated high school. So Junko was riding her bike home from her after school job and Miyano, Captain Reject, was watching her, right? And he planned, concocted this little scheme where he had one of his buddies run up to Junko while she was riding her bike and just kind of kick her off or knock her off or whatever. And then Captain Reject runs along and he's just like, oh, what happened? Are you okay? Yeah, let me help you out. Uh, can I walk you home? Trying to act all like Prince Charming. Now Junko just being the absolute angel that she is, she just, okay, she's like, all right, yeah, um, sure. But that was not part of Miyano's plan. He actually ended up leading her into an abandoned warehouse. And once he got Junko in here, he revealed his Yakuza connections to her, threatening her that she had to do whatever he said. And if she didn't, she would not only hurt her, but also her family. And so begins Junko's torment. He ended up taking advantage of her and ravaging her in the warehouse again and again, multiple times. And then he ended up taking her to a nearby hotel and did it again. Afterwards, he then called his other friend the guy that kicked her off the bike and did that whole little stunt earlier, as well as two more other guys. 
a total of four that were the main four involved in all of this. Miano, now having his three buddies with them, bragged and boasted that, hey, look, I got this girl here, she's under my control, and yeah, I took advantage of her, look how cool I am. And of course, to his friends, he seemed cool. Now this group of guys, some of them being underage, some of them being, I think, like right at 18, they have a history of gang, R word, against women. Kidnapping, assault, you name it. Now later that night, around 3 a.m., they learned where she lived, where her home address was by looking through her notebook and finding out that she had, you know, jotted down her address somewhere in there. And this is when they really threatened her, you know, if you ever try and escape, you know, like, we'll murder your whole family, so don't even think about it. They ended up taking her to a nearby park where the four of them overpowered her and ravaged her again before taking her to the district of Adachi and took her into a house there that was actually owned by the guy that kicked her off the bike. Yeah, his parents owned the house and he brought Junko back there. And this house soon basically became, you know, the gang's regular hangout spot for where they do illegal stuff, where they meet, talk about plans, and where they... where they have Junko. Now, from what I hear, Minato's parents, the, you know, the guy that kicked her off the bike, his name's Minato, and his parents, um, I think his brother, younger brother, maybe older brother, I'm not exactly sure. The reason that they didn't tell anybody that, hey, like, my son is doing this, you know, and has a girl hostage here and is taking advantage and doing all these terrible things is because they too were afraid of the connections that they had with the Yakuza. That's how on edge people were about even just possible rumors about being affiliated with, you know, the Japanese mafia. Now, personally, I don't know. I don't think that's enough, you know, for them to just still turn a blind eye. Because if you think about it, if I knew that somebody had an innocent girl, you know, upstairs in my freaking house, I don't give a shit if I'm going to get hurt in the process, but I'm going to take a damn chance to get her some help because it's the right thing to do. So I still don't forgive them, I guess, for turning a blind eye and just sort of letting all this happen. Because if you think about it, how much torment and suffering would she have been relieved of if they had just said something, if they had just spoken out? I mean, they could have gotten all of them arrested, right? Okay, listen, I'm digressing a little bit because we, we can talk more about the prosecution and everything later. So basically this house became Junko's home for the next 40, 42 to 44 days. They're, they're surmising it's about that much. Now, the group of boys did also make Junko call her parents and tell them to not do any investigations, like, I'm fine, don't worry about me. I just ran away with a friend for a little bit or something. I'm like, it's okay, you don't have to worry about me. And while the parents did listen to Junko initially, they could still kind of sense that something was off. And speaking about pretending to go back to Minato's parents, the owners of the house where all this was happening, at first, uh, Junko was forced to sort of pose as Minato's girlfriend, you know, in front of his parents who owned the house. But they later kind of just gave up with like trying to fool them because they figured it out. And once they realized that, okay, they're scared of me, you know, they're, they're, my parents are scared of me, they're not going to report me to the police. They just dropped the act, you know, and they just continued doing what they were doing. And so, over the next 40 days, Junko was repeatedly beaten, R-worded, and tortured. I'm not going to get into all of the details, but I I'll give you some of them. But if you want, it's all public information and you can look it up. But the things that she went through were stomach-turning. After she was only a quarter into her capture, she already couldn't breathe through her nose because her nasal cavities were so filled and clotted with blood that she just couldn't breathe anymore. At this point, her internal organs were beginning to malfunction and she couldn't eat or drink properly. And every time she would try to, she would just end up throwing up, which again, just made her captors more upset, which followed with more beatings. Now, fast forward, maybe a few weeks later, Junko gets an opportunity. While her captors are resting after a good old night of drinking, she tries her best to make her way downstairs 
to the phone. It takes her a long time. Her heart is pounding, hoping to God that she does not get caught. You can imagine how much pain this girl is probably in already. She can probably hardly move. But she made her way downstairs. She got to the phone. She was able to dial 911. But before she was able to say anything, one of the boys grabbed her. They took the phone. They said, sorry, I dialed by mistake. They hung up. Now, you can only imagine what happens next. In order to punish her for her disobedient behavior, they poured lighter fluid all over her feet and her legs, and they set her on fire. Now we're about 20 days into her capture, and she has severe leg burns and muscle damage, leaving her unable to even walk. She can't even use her hands and hold anything with her hands anymore because her hands have been smashed with dumbbells and other various, you know, heavy objects breaking the bones. They were smashed so bad that even her fingernails were cracked. There were some nights where it was really cold out, you know, it's like approaching winter and the boys even made her sleep on the balcony in near freezing weather. Now we're about 30 days into her capture and she can't even go to the bathroom properly. She can't, she can barely move at all now. It takes her an hour to get to the bathroom. Her internal organs are at an all-time low, barely functioning. It's honestly a miracle that she's even survived so far. During her 44 days of capture, it's said that she begged her captors multiple times to just and be done with it, but they wouldn't grant her that. However, there was one small little triumph that Junko did get on these guys. On January 4th, 1989, the boys challenged her to a game of mahjong. It's kind of like a solitaire, I guess. I I've never played. But just for fun, they challenged Junko to see if they could beat her. And she mopped the floor with them. She destroyed them. She just embarrassed them. And, you know, it, it probably made Junko feel a little bit good, you know, to have just that tiny bit of satisfaction that, you know, she got to stick it to him in some way. But... Of course, as you probably have guessed, they did not like that. They were not happy. They then beat her with an iron barbell. Now that she's already severely beaten, dehydrated, malnourished, she her body is giving out on her and she went into shock. At this point, the guys are starting to panic. They're trying to figure out, okay, if she dies, you know, we have to deal with a corpse. Like, what are we gonna do? Well, there was nothing they could do because the following day, the 44th day of her capture, Junko passed away. She finally succumbed to her injuries. <sighs> She's finally at peace. Now, to get rid of her body, the guys, I guess, tried to come up with the best plan that they could think of, which honestly is not even that great of a plan because they're just a bunch of idiots. They put her body into a 55 gallon container and filled it with concrete, but her hair was still kind of like sticking out at the top. Now, I'm not exactly sure how everyone was caught and how it all kind of came into prosecution, but after they were captured, this part is just crazy. The amount of time that these guys faced in pr just take a guess, guys. How much time do you think these four high school guys, some of them like right about to be 18, maybe a year or two younger, how much time do you think these guys got for all of these things that they are responsible for? Okay, just hold your thoughts and just give me give me a couple minutes, okay? Let, let's I want to go over this real quick. Now, at first, the Japanese court withheld the names of these four boys because, you know, some of them were minors at the time. They are considered juveniles, right? So they protect their names. However, there was a magazine that found out the names of these guys and they were just like, fuck you. You are not even human at this point. You, you lost all of your freaking rights a long time ago. We're leaking your names to the entire country. And that's what they did. And soon, everybody knew the four names of these boys. Hiroshi Miyano, age 18. Joe Ogura, age 18. Shinji Minato, age 16 at the time, and Yasui Watanabe, 17 years old at the time. I'm just so glad that, you know, like, we're seeing just a little bit of justice, finally, after so much just terrible, evil things. And that's one of the reasons why this case just makes me so sad and upset. Now, some of these guys, you know, two of them were 18 at the time, but from what I've read, they were all tried as juveniles. I'm 
Not exactly sure why, because if at least two of them were 18, shouldn't they have been tried as adults? I mean, even in Korea, which is where I live now, 18 is still 18. But it doesn't really matter because eventually they all ended up facing adult sentences anyway. But it's not too much to applaud because regardless that they were tried as adults or not, their sentences, as I asked you guys to guess earlier, were extremely low. By now, as of the time you're watching this video, you know, over 30 years later, all of these guys are already out of jail. Yes, none of them got life imprisonment. None of them will truly pay for their crimes for what they did to Junko. Three of these boys served less than eight years, and the leader, Miyano, he served the most time. I think it was uh, 17 years. But he, this guy, he actually tried to appeal his sentence to the judge. And this judge, thank, thank God for this judge. Like, bless this judge. This judge was pissed off that this guy even had the audacity to try and appeal his sentence. So this judge was like another, fuck you, and he gave him 20 years. So instead of lowering his sentence, they upped it. And it gets a little bit better because two other boys out of the four also tried to appeal their sentences. And the judge was like, nope, you're going up and uh, you're going up too. Anyone else? Who's next? And the one remaining guy was like, all right, um, yeah, you know what? I'm fine with my sentence. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just keep it. So the last boy, he didn't even try to appeal. Shame. Now, how this all wraps up, you know, like some of these guys got out of jail and are they still, you know, up to no good? Have they repented for their crimes? Have they changed? No. Why would they? If they're even capable of doing this, they're, you're not even a human in my eyes anymore. You're, you're incapable of redemption at this point. For example, uh, one of these guys was released in like 1999 and he went back to jail like five years later in 2004. And he went back to jail for like seven years for like beating the crap out of a guy who he thought was trying to like steal his girlfriend. Another little interesting side note, which it's not much, but they were able to link a few other names to Junko's case, you know, to the people that, you know, took advantage of her because uh, there was some DNA that they found and they were able to like file it and link it back to some names later on of some members of some Yakuza, I think, and just some other guys that are known, you know, to have like priors and crimes. I don't exactly know where it went with that, if they got them on anything, I don't think so. But I guess just the main thing I wanted to touch on with the prosecution is just the absolute ridiculousness of the court systems in countries like Japan and South Korea, where I live now. What I think just affects me the most and really just makes me upset is the way it sounds, these punishments that these boys received for what they did are not too far off from the punishments that people receive now 30 years later. More than 30 years later. It's going on like 34, 35 years later. Even now in South Korea, like I would know, I hear about it in the news all the time and it just aggravates me so much. But in Japan and South Korea, you know, they're kind of similar in that regard. Laws about, you know, like harassment and just crimes, they, the punishments are so outdated, it's mind blowing. Like, I could just, I could talk about it for hours. When they go from where they were 30 to 40 years ago to where they are now, you know, like one of the top 10 economies in the world, top countries in the world. When you do that in such a short amount of time, sure, you're gonna see a lot of things that may seem futuristic and like advanced. And you know, Japan and South Korea are known for a lot of, you know, uh, things that are considered advanced and high tech. But at the same time, some things that are moving forward really fast are not gonna be moving at the same speed as others. And one of those things that moves at an extremely slow rate is the judicial system. While Japan and Korea may have advanced in crazy ways in the last 30 to 40 years, their judicial systems and the way that they handle crimes like this have barely changed. Just a couple years ago, I think in Korea, and I don't even know what it is in Japan, but just like a couple years ago, the age of consent in Korea, it was like 13 or 14, but they recently just changed it to 16. Like what the, f what the heck? How is that, what? Like how old does that mindset have to be where you can even consider that is okay? Like, do, so do you see what I'm saying? Like a lot of these 
you know, systems in place, they're archaic, they're outdated. The mindsets that were behind them are dated. And it just really upsets me that the crimes are, if anything, getting worse, happening more frequently, but the people responsible are still getting out with short sentences. They're able to just resume their life. Some of them are even getting out and doing it again. Why? Why are they releasing them so that they can harass and hurt more innocent people? Ugh. So anyways, it just, it makes me so upset because Korea and Japan, that we need to crack down on, you know, punishments. Like lock these guys up for more time, please. They clearly are not rehabilitated. Anyways. I could talk about that for so long, but I won't talk about it too much more. At least, not in this video. In closing, I just, I want to say RIP to Junko. She didn't deserve this. Not one bit. And for me personally, it just hurts the most because she never did anything wrong, you know? Like, when it's, when it's really, really innocent people, like, just like, people that can do no evil and are just so harmless. It's just such a tragic thing, and it's just, it's so sad because she was so young and she had a lot to live for. And for her to just have all of that taken so young, it's just sad and my heart truly goes out to her and her family. So that is the story of Junko Furuta. Now, I'm not expecting YouTube to really put this on recommended, I doubt it, but you know, I just thought it was an important case to talk about and I wanted to speak with you guys about it because, you know, I just was coming at you raw, I was being real, and I just, I don't know, I just wanted to, I wanted to get it out there. I hope you guys enjoyed this long podcasty type of whatever, get ready with me type of thing. I don't exactly know what I'm going for exactly, but I wanted to keep it simple. I wanted to talk to you guys. Some of you have been begging me for years to start some kind of podcast, so I don't know. If you guys enjoy this type of format, maybe I can continue and keep up with it if you like. Anyways, uh, thanks so much for watching, guys. If you want, you can uh, follow me on my socials on Twitter or Instagram. Uh, if you want to catch me live streaming where I'm just chilling, it's a lot more relaxed. I play games, I have fun. Follow me on my Twitch channel, that's uh, twitch.tv slash terrytvlive. Also, links are down below. And let me know what you thought about this case. I hope it didn't put you guys off too much, but, you know, really what I was going for was I just wanted to have a, a dialogue with you about, you know, so many things that are wrong with this case, with the punishment. Anyways, that'll about do it for today's video, so thank you guys so much for watching, and until next time, good night.